the ASRock Phantom Gaming RX 6500 XT. And this is not what you think. Is there something rotten in Denmark? Well, no, not exactly. Nothing like that, nothing at all. I've got it set up here in my system. We're gonna take a look. I'm using that in our Core i5-12400 system right behind me. And I'm not entirely unhappy. This is a gaming GPU, and it was released just recently, and as RX 6500s go, this is a pretty good one. It's aimed at the sub $300 GPU market, but if you're gonna buy a GPU in May of 2022, you should know the full picture of what you're getting yourself into because uh, it could be a little bit of a mess. I mean, if we get right down to it, this GPU might be the peanut butter stuffed onion for gamers craving a GPU sustenance. Though as of now, GPU prices are finally trending downwards. Prices for GPUs at the uh, lower end have been a little bit more stubborn about trending downward. It's not great. If you want to spend less than $300 on a GPU, you might actually be better off in a used market. And at around $300, the RX 6600 should be attainable. Note that that's 6600 without the XT. So for gamers, I really do hope the prices go lower and break through that $300 floor. But what's happening this time around with the cryptocurrency crash and GPU prices is a little more complicated than what happened last time in 2018. What happened last time? Oh, nothing. Nvidia just lost $23 billion in value basically overnight because of the cryptocurrency crash. I mean, uh, GPU demand went downward and then they couldn't get rid of it and you don't want to sell GPUs at a loss. People stopped buying GPUs to earn a profit and they went back to buying GPUs to play games. But, uh, you know, the market's a little different right now. And, you know, of course, in, in 2018, NVIDIA had a market value of around 100 billion. And today, NVIDIA's market value is over 500 billion, 550 billion-ish, last time I checked. So things have changed somewhat. And uh, the biggest change also is the GPUs can be used for things other than gaming and cryptocurrency mining. At least those, those, those uses are a lot more commonplace than they were. AI and research, things that need a lot of computation, are also driving the bottom line of the whole industry. Now with AMD, it was a little harder to dissect because well, AMD's doing a lot more than just GPUs, but they were definitely negatively impacted too in 2018. So over the last five years, both companies have dramatically diversified their products and their clientele. So they're able to absorb things just a little bit better. And you know, I don't know if it makes sense for these companies to worry about sub $300 GPUs because what it means to be a sub $300 GPU is kind of looking and sort of changing, I think. Let's take a look at the landscape. Here's an NVIDIA GTX 1050. It launched in 2016, and as, as I recall, it was around $100. It's actually gone up in price since 2016, and that's just because of a lot of factors, but $100. In a lot of cases, AMD's got an APU that comes close to beating it in 2022. With Intel's XE on the horizon, and as we've seen in Valve's Steam Deck, the future really is looking bright for APUs because the Steam Deck, oh, it's, it's a lot of power. So the RX 6500 and maybe the 6400 coming soon, uh, entry level gaming, it's a little problematic. You may be, you know, setting up yourself for some pitfalls if you pick up one of these GPUs. So let's, let's walk through that. Now the CPU in here from Intel is PCI Express 4. And it's part of the Alder Lake family. So those P cores, oh, they're really fast. There's also a Pentium and an i3. All three of those CPUs are based around the Alder Lake P core design. This one's six P cores. 12400 is definitely the most expensive of the bunch. It's gonna set you back almost $200, but it is a great CPU. Really, the most undesirable thing about a build that combines the RX 6500 and the i5 2400, that motherboard is annoyingly expensive. Z690 or or the, uh, the lesser expensive Intel chipsets. I mean, you can definitely tell that Intel's feeling the heat from AMD. So there's some aggressive pricing here. Maybe try to make that up a little bit in the motherboard cost. Doing a similar build from Team Red, you could probably afford an eight core CPU instead of six cores here, but those, those cores are gonna be a little bit slower. But you're also gonna have a potentially much, much less expensive motherboard. Now our Phantom Gaming GPU, it's got four gigs of VRAM. That means your games aren't going to run at the highest end visual fidelity settings. Although, I mean, if we really get down to it, 
that's not exactly true at 1080p and below, but it's more complicated than that. AAA games, sometimes higher detail is fine, sometimes not. But before we get into the performance, I will say it doesn't have much ray tracing capability. I mean, there are 16 RT cores, that's on the spec sheet, but most games are not doing a good job making the most of those ray tracing cores. You could maybe enjoy a little bit of light ray tracing. Quake ray traced, probably not super terrible on this GPU. Some other stuff, Shadow of the Tomb Raider can give you some ray traced shadows, but that's it. But, you know, generally ray tracing, not lower your expectations. To explain the performance of this card, which I think is quite good, you really have to understand the potential pitfalls of it because the pitfalls are perilous. We can take a look at two games side by side. We can take a look at two games side by side, Cyberpunk and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and uh, see how that goes. It was the best of frame rates. It was the worst of frame rates. It was the age of incredulity. It was the age of wisdom. <sighs> All right. 1080p, 60-ish FPS, okay? Let's run some different benchmarks and see how that does. All right, let's start with Cyberpunk 2077. Use the 1080p low preset and run the benchmark. It's gonna average 60 FPS. Okay, let's crank it. High preset, okay? It's still it's a little worse, but still 60-ish FPS. Interesting. Now note that I'm using MSI Afterburner in the top left corner and I can see that Cyberpunk is regularly using more than the four gigabytes of VRAM that I physically have on this card. That means it's going to overrun the video memory on the video card, and it'll use system memory for the overflow. That means it's gotta go over the PCIe bus, the PCIe connection for the graphics card. But this card, being at the low end, it's only got four PCI Express 4.0 lanes. So it's only four lanes wide, it's a relatively narrow bus interface, PCI Express 4 signaling. We'll come back to that. Even on high visual fidelity, it does decently okay at 1080p. We're, we're staying pretty close to 60 FPS, and with a free sync monitor, that'd be a pretty good gaming experience. All right, let's step it up to 1440p. Oh wow, that is a terrible gaming experience. We went from almost 60 FPS to like 10, 12? Yeah. In Afterburner, in the little graph, you don't really get a super clear indication of what's happening either. We are really badly overrunning our VRAM. And even at 1440p low, you don't get a reasonable amount of performance out of it because Cyberpunk is really badly managing the VRAM. Let's switch it up to Shadow of the Tomb Raider for a second. So with Shadow of the Tomb Raider running at 1440p, but we're keeping textures high, ouch, that's really not dramatically better than Cyberpunk. I mean, okay, it's a little bit better. Tomb Raider's doing a much better job managing the extreme limitations of the four gigs of VRAM and the impossible ask of the highest resolution textures that the dumb user has uh, selected for Shadow of the Tomb Raider. If we dial that down to medium or normal textures, now we can manage closer to 60 FPS at the much higher 1440p resolution. But, but Cyberpunk was unplayable at 1440p in any scenario with the 1440p resolution. That's because Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a lot more optimized. It's an older game, and it was originally designed with GPUs that only had 4 gigs of VRAM in mind. The Cyberpunk devs really haven't put a lot of work into trying to make it run with the relatively limited amount of memory. And you can kind of offset that by using system memory as long as you've got a fast interface between the GPU and memory. With four PCI Express 4 lanes, it's about equivalent to eight PCI Express 3.0 lanes of last generation, so it's not entirely unreasonable. But what happens if you don't have PCI Express 4 lanes? What if you've only got four PCI Express 3 lanes because your CPU will only do PCI Express 3? Ah, there's the rub, we'll come back to that. But it's not just a question of overrunning the amount of VRAM. I mean, 10 FPS is not an acceptable result in Cyberpunk at 1440p. Yeah, I mean, 1080p is fine. 1080p is great in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but it's not really that simple. There's actually two other factors that contribute to a poor gameplay experience uh, that you don't really have to worry about with the other contemporary video cards. And the first one is memory leaks in the game. You see, Cyberpunk, when you've been playing it for a couple of hours, uh, it can have a memory leak. And what a memory leak is, is that as you do stuff in the game, the game is loading stuff, and then it puts stuff in video memory, and then theoretically when it's done, it will take that out of video memory, because you've entered a new area, uh, the boss is gone, a different car has loaded, but there's a memory leak when something doesn't get unloaded that was supposed to be unloaded. 
that memory is still allocated and is unavailable for other stuff. So you might start to see your frame rate decline as a result of game bugs or even driver bugs. It's gonna be up to the game dev most of the time to fix that. The second problem is the PCIe bus speed problem. You see, even if you're running out of video memory, sometimes you can shuffle that into main memory. It's like, well, I don't think we'll need this, so I'll put it in system memory, but maybe we'll, we'll need it later, versus just get, getting rid of it. So AMD released some new lower end CPUs for gamers, CPUs like the Ryzen 5500. Unfortunately, that Ryzen lacks PCI Express 4 capabilities, which means that this GPU will be running at PCI Express 3.0 speed. It's not just if you've got an older computer that's got PCI Express 3, you gotta worry about this. Your new computer might not support PCI Express 4. If you overrun the video RAM, then you're gonna have bad performance. That's the pitfall. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it's pretty good about managing its VRAM usage and there's really not a lot of difference in performance between PCIe 3.0 and PCIe 4.0, at least in reasonable settings. For our retest here, we dialed down our PCI Express speed to PCIe 3.0 with the highest textures, and look at that, we're, we're down to 18 FPS. And the performance is a little worse, even at 1080, because it still has to juggle some resources, but it's not, it's not bad. With Cyberpunk and PCI Express 3, it's a worse experience. So just that one change from PCI Express 4 to 3, even on the same system, just the BIOS change was enough to basically tank our Tomb Raider performance above 1080p, 1440. 19 FPS, ugh. But 1080p medium is a different story. Well over 60 FPS. Now, this is a best worst case scenario. If your CPU is only capable of PCI Express 3, it's going to be worse. This is a CPU that's capable of PCI Express 4, but we've turned it off because that is the absolute maximum best case scenario that you'll have with a PCI Express 3 capable CPU. But if you have an inexpensive PCI Express capable CPU, well, it's only gonna be worse from here. It really is butter smooth, even though it's only PCI Express 3.0. It's all down to the VRAM. Well, it's all down to the VRAM and then the consequence of exceeding that, wherein you have to go over the system bus. <laughs> Does this imply that we'll see GPUs in the future that are PCI Express 4.0 by 2? <laughs> I hope not. Our PCI Express 3.0, 1080p medium result, 68 FPS average. Entirely reasonable for our PCI Express 3.0 constraint. Now, PCI Express 4.0, probably be even a little bit better. If we switch to Far Cry 6, we take a look at the numbers from Far Cry 6. Uh, you can really cause bad things to happen. Far Cry 6 has an HD texture pack. An HD texture pack is designed for GPUs that have like 16 gigs of VRAM. If you load that in, then you're going to get like 4 FPS in Far Cry. But Far Cry otherwise has reasonable performance at other resolutions. It's even possible to cause games to crash. Games like Fortnite, if you turn everything up to the maximum or you go back and forth between... Uh, a machine with a multi-thousand dollar GPU and, and one of these GPUs, you can actually cause Fortnite to crash because it's so badly overrunning the VRAM. Far Cry 6 on medium, 1080p, that's reasonable and it's perfectly playable. It's a good frame rate. It's even better than Cyberpunk about managing the resources, although maybe not as good as Tomb Raider. This is Halo Infinite at 4K. It says that it's using 3.86 gigs of VRAM, but we're also playing it at 4K. What it means is... It's using 3.86 gigs of VRAM plus a lot more. That's not gonna run well. Our Halo preset is medium high. It's high, but with a texture set on medium, 3.28 gigs of VRAM usage, you know, sort of staying in our ideal zone. So there's Halo Infinite the campaign and the Halo Infinite the multiplayer game. Halo Infinite the game, probably low settings. Halo Infinite the multiplayer game, medium, medium high. A little more reasonable. Multiplayer bot boot camp it is. So as a gamer, this GPU basically asks you to be aware of your PCIe bus speed, are you on 3.0 or 4.0, and how does your game use VRAM? You really gotta sort of manage those at least a little bit to get the most enjoyment possible out of this card, because it actually does have reasonable performance. And to be fair, AMD does address this kind of thing somewhat in their Radeon driver UI. They help you optimize game settings and not pick settings that don't make sense for these cards. Things like enabling the HD texture pack for 
Far Cry 6. Because otherwise, Far Cry 6 goes out of its way to try to stop you from over allocating the amount of VRAM. And if you want to play at 1080p high, I mean, I can manage, uh, you know, 78 FPS in Halo Infinite on 1080p high, Apex Legends and Fortnite, you can get, you know, 90 to 100 FPS. That's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty good performance, especially if this card is inexpensive in the market. Sticking to 1080p medium high in most titles, that's not too much effort to get a good frame rate. But be aware of HD textures and, and you know high graphic detail or high reflection detail can cause the performance of this GPU to tank disproportionately more than other GPUs from generations gone by. Uh, in terms of other features for this card, it really doesn't have much. There's, there's, no, there's no facilities for streamers, there's no hardware encoding for streamers, so if you stream games, this GPU's not gonna help you. Probably save some silicon real estate and uh, licensing by not having the encoders. It can decode H.264 and H.265, but the uh, newer codecs like VP1, it doesn't support. So decoding with like Netflix and streaming services is fine, but there's no encoding, so you're not going to be transmitting, you can be receiving. Noise and thermals were great, it's got two outputs though, just two, HDMI 2.1 and DisplayPort 1.4. Overall, I like this card more than most people, I think. I think it should be cheaper than where it is now in the market, but we may get that. So the bottom line is, at least if you're thinking about this card, and this card is priced anywhere close to $300, just save up and get the RX 6600. That's gonna be a much better card. It's got a much better PCIe interface. So much less things to worry about, more VRAM. If you're thinking maybe Team Green has something for you, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Nvidia has their own struggles at this price point, which are kind of interesting and different. They initially came out with the RTX 3060, which mm, pricing, not great on that. And they misjudged how good the AMD cards were, in my opinion. So Nvidia had to immediately rush out the 3060 Ti. And now we have this weird 3060 12 gig, which doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. It's got 12 gigs of VRAM, that's great, but it completely lacks the uh, core GPU horsepower to do anything with that. So well, Nvidia and AMD, they're, they're both kind of struggling at the low end here. Remember I mentioned the, uh, the Steam Deck? It took us from 2016 until now to get APUs that are as good as the GTX 1050. How long do you think it'll be before there's a desktop CPU with RX 6500 levels of XT performance built right into the CPU? I'll tell you this much, it's not gonna be another five years. It's probably right around the corner. But for now, if you have to have something in this great depression of GPUs, I think this GPU is more peanut butter stuffed onions, which isn't half bad, really, if you, if you tried it. It's a lot better than uh, eating boiled shoe leather, I'll tell you that. And my guess is that if these are available, if vendors choose to make them, the price is probably gonna settle out well below $300. And you can get good to great 1080p performance out of this card if you're aware of this card's limitations and how it relates to PCIe and VRAM and your particular games and the bugs that your games have. Oh, and this card's probably not very future-proof because four gig was not really enough a couple of years ago. But, inexpensive? I don't know. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at the ASRock RX 6500 XT Phantom Gaming. I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level 1 forums.